presentation of dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And the first thing that flashed in my mind was this incredible sense of gratitude for my family and my grandparents, my parents, the decisions, all the decisions, all the sacrifices they made on my behalf for this moment to happen. And I just pulled over the side of the road and started weeping. Coming up, a conversation with poet Richard Blanco about longing and belonging and poetry's ability to bridge the two. That's Dialogue Next. Stay tuned. Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, America, one today. Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Marcia Franklin. You were just listening to a moment that changed the life of poet Richard Blanco as he read a poem he was asked to compose for President Obama's second inauguration in 2013. Blanco was only the fifth inaugural poet in American history. In becoming that, he also set a number of firsts as well. And we'll talk about those as well as his body of work with Mr. Blanco, who is my guest today. Welcome. Great. Thank you. Great to be here. It's great to have you. Now, a bit more about Richard Blanco. He's the author of two memoirs and four poetry collections, including Looking for the Gulf Motel, City of a Hundred Fires, and For All of Us, One Today. His latest book is called How to Love a Country. It's a collection of poems he calls, quote, both a statement of our hope in our nationhood and an implied question about our struggles with it. Mr. Blanco is also the first ever education ambassador for the Academy of American Poets. He's in Boise as the keynote speaker for the Idaho Humanities Council's annual Distinguished Humanities Lecture. And we're uh, pleased to have you here, and thanks to the Humanities Council for making time in your schedule to sure, do this. Sure. It's great to be here. Well, I I can't uh, start without a little kind of inside joke, which is, <laughs> have you ever been interviewed by a Marsha before? And uh, what do you I think of that? About that. <laughs> certainly not. Uh, that is certainly a, not a Marsha Brady. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's an inside joke because, of course, uh, the Brady Bunch right. and uh, Marsha included features quite prominently in um, your books, both your memoir and in your poetry. And that's because the Brady Bunch was kind of a iconic program for you Certainly. growing up, in almost a, an image of an America that you okay. kind of longed for, didn't quite understand. And yeah, it's very interesting because I, it, growing up in Miami, um, as I like to say, Miami was a very undiverse place in the sense that diversity is kind of relative. and so. Most of, you know, 90% of my schoolmates and, I, and my entire neighborhood were kind of just like my family, um, you know, exiles or children of exiles. Cuba. And so the only way I kind of contextualized in America, so it felt like I was in America, but not quite, was through shows like The Brady Bunch, Donna Reed. But it was more than just sort of, it was really, I really did believe that once I got out of Miami, that that's exactly how everybody lived. And it was in a weird way, it was kind of in a, in a way, uh, that's what became exotic to me, not what I knew. My given culture was, uh, growing up, I took for granted and didn't realize that I was the one that was different. No, in my, in my scenario, it's like, to be different was, you know, was that other. And that's what became more attractive. Who wanted to be Cuban when everybody around you was Cuban? So, well, you know, you've said that you kind of felt in between two kind of um, misunder, you know, two worlds, really, mm -hmm. actually three, because one you didn't quite even acknowledge at the time, which is that you're gay. And so you were living between all these different worlds trying to figure out where you belonged. Yeah, yeah, that's a very. Um, it's interesting, yeah, three worlds. Um, what I call real imagined worlds, right? So one, of course, was what we're talking about. This sort of, we lived in the United States, but where is exactly You're that world? Cuban, But there was American. also the Cuban. I wasn't born in Cuba, but I was obviously my, my given culture and my community was all Cuban, but where was this mythical Cuba that we all came from and that in the eyes of an exile and the psyche of the exile, we're going back to someday because that's the sense we grew up. This is a temporary time, right? So you're Cuban, you be, you're from Cuba. I'm like, I wasn't even born there. So, but it was really, it was real in some sense because it was a living culture in front of me, but also the mis mis this mysterious Eden that existed somewhere. 
And yeah, you're right. The, the third really imagined world was 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 my sexuality, something that, um, in a way, is another kind of home uh, uh, that I didn't find too much later in life. But it's again sort of psychically, well, not psychically, but psychologically all connected. It's always this thing of trying to belong to some place, some thing, someone, to fit in. This yearning to to belong, and so that was another sort of real imagined world and and a place I didn't quite know where that was. And it's not necessarily a physical space, but a, a sense of being. Right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, you were encouraged, although you liked art and things like that, you were encouraged to become a professional, I guess we might right. say. Um, and you became an, en an engineer right. uh, because that was, of course, going to pay more for one thing. Right. But also that's that in culturally was what you were being pushed towards. Yeah, I mean, so much. I mean, and again, you were good at it. Yeah, I, I was always a left brain, right brain kid, so that you know it was kind of like an embarrassment of riches in the sense that I, I could have picked any major and I would have loved it, right? But of course, working in an immigrant class family is you know, and even most most families still prefer to you know children to study the more traditional doctor, lawyer, engineer, and whatnot. So I loved math, and I went into engineering. Um, uh, and uh, I've been a practicing civil engineer and poet all my life. Um, and it's funny because when I, when I become when you get your license, you get PE after your name, like professional engineer. But in my case, it was poet engineer. <laughs> we like to engineer. Uh, poet engineer. I know. I, I'm, I'm making <laughs> up a new word. A pen engineer. I like, like pen. That. that was a great pen. joke. I got to steal that one. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I always carried both, and I think that's taught me a lot of life lessons and something that I. I speak to now the importance of having sort of a, a wide, a wide sense of, uh, of knowledge or a wide knowledge base that I think helps, helps you be the best at whatever you're doing. But that's uh, that's neither here nor there. But um, yeah, it was actually in engineering that um, I um, discovered poetry. Um, as I started writing, I realized that my job was about 50% writing proposals, studies, letters, whatnot. And uh, then my job depended on it. And when I got you know a forty million dollar proposal into the into the firm, guess who got promoted? And it was all basically writing a narrative about your vision for the project, uh, you know, sort of uh, embellishing the worth of your firm, right? Talk about creative writing, right? And so my left right brain kicked in and said, "Hey, we're we going to do something creative." And I thought, "What's the weirdest thing that I know nothing about?" And I thought. Let's start writing poetry, <laughs> and so I did really terrible poems at first. But eventually, so I didn't start writing. It's about 25, 26. But it was when I, I did it for, to give myself a gift. I thought this wasn't supposed to be a career. It was just something that I wanted to give to myself as an adult, and I could afford to be on my own and and not have to worry about any kind of family expectations. Um, and that's how yeah, that's how it all started. And uh, I love the fact that the first poem you were asked to write when you were starting to learn about this was, what is America to you, right. you know? <laughs> because that has been such, such a grounding of all your work since then, including the inaugural poem, which we'll talk about, is yeah. what does it mean to be an American? What is American, America to me? Uh, that's yeah, sometimes, really sometimes I just feel like, well, I think we all feel this way. Sometimes we feel our, our lives are complete um, mayhem and happenstance, and then sometimes you feel your life is completely scripted. And that first poetry assignment really set the tone of what I'm still writing about today. I mean, it, it just triggered uh, that whole idea of longing, belonging, and place and identity, which I knew was in me, but the words made me actually become conscious of it, right? It wasn't like I was dealing with these kinds of issues at five or six. It was just happening, but on a, not on a conscious level, right? And of course, uh, Marsha Brady makes her first appearance in my very first <laughs> poem. Um, so um, it's, and it really just, uh, it gave me an assignment for the rest of my life. And uh, as I like to say, um, you know, every writer is working off of some kind of obsession, some unresolved, sort of really central, uh, a part of their being. And for me, again, since I was 45 days old, I belonged to three countries, Cuba, Spain, the United States, and belonged to no country at the same time. So I think all that um, eventually was imprinting in me, and um, and um, it still is. I'm still exploring what does that what does that big word home mean? What does it mean to belong? How do we know? Where, and then country being a big part of what our sense of home is, right? So you kept uh, writing poetry at the same time that you were an engineer, yep. um, and 
it was getting published and uh, one day you get a call in 2012, early 2013 or 2012, end of 2012? Yeah, 12, 12, 12. <laughs> 12, 12, 12. Well, that's, it, that's poetic so too, <laughs> isn't it? Uh, not to mention palindromic, right? right. <laughs> it's backwards and forwards. My engineering license is a palindrome 53135. <laughs> I'm telling you, sometimes I, you think your life is, and then you feel like, okay, there's something going on here. Yeah, well, palindromes are cool. Um, so, you, so you get this call, it's from the Obama, someone in the Obama administration, and they're saying, hi, we <laughs> want you to write right. a poem right. for the inaugural. Is that kind of what went down? Yeah, it was really interesting. I was, um, Again, I had been managing both my careers, I had fairly successful and, and you know, um, recognized poet, a few awards, a number of belt, three books, and whatnot. Um, but also realizing poetry is a vocation. You just sort of do it and you just wait till something happens or doesn't happen, but you just keep on doing it. It's, it's a vocation, it's a labor of love. And so this was that moment. But it was really funny as you don't, this is the most unexpected phone call, right? at least with the Pulitzer Prize or something, you know you're shortlisted or <laughs> right. or usually or, or prize you apply for right. or grant. This is just out of the blue. And so I was driving, uh, I was stuck in a traffic jam somewhere in Massachusetts, and um, I didn't understand what they were saying. I'm like, what? Like, boom, do you want me to go to the White House? They're like, and the, the, the person kind of got a little impatient with me and said no, and she finally said, no, like Robert Frost and Maya Angelou. I'm like, oh, that poet. <laughs> That's what you want me to do. And then at that point, I thought, this is my friend Brian, who's put up somebody to like play a prank on me. Like, why would I get this call? Um, and so uh, I Googled the person's name. And sure enough, it came up presidential inaugural committee, surrogate scheduler, scheduler of surrogates. That was the title. And I thought, oh my god, this is it. This is it. But ironically, and not ironically, but surprisingly, uh, I wasn't panicky, feared, and said, and the first thing that flashed in my mind was this incredible sense of gratitude for my family and my grandparents, my parents, the decisions, all the decisions, all the sacrifices they made on my behalf to for this moment to happen. And I just pulled over the side of the road and started weeping, like thinking, wow, like you. You know, I just realized we think that we're in control of our lives or that the stories that we write started from the day that we started writing them. And you realize the story, our, our life story really begins in the fifth act of some other story. Um, and that, you know, I always imagine what if my parents had made different decisions? What if my mother was very insistent on education? You know, we wouldn't put on the AC in the house just so we could afford it relatively cheap parochial Catholic school for a little bit of a better education. Um, so yeah, all that flashed before my eyes, before the terror and the panic of having to write three poems in three weeks, which is not a terrible thing, except this is the most important poem of my life. <laughs> so yeah, they, they wanted three poems for, from you, which is, as I understand it, the, the person who read it, the first Obama inaugural did not have that tall of a task. Um, so one of the poems you wrote, which does um, reflect on what you just said about your mom's sacrifice, was called Mother Country. Mm -hmm. And it's about leaving a country, leaving it all behind. And, and could we do that? Could we leave America yeah. behind? And in doing so, thinking about what you love about a country, what you'd miss, that was the poem you were really attracted to. You know, you had that personal connection to it. But the, the committee or commission um, picked one of the other three. Right. And as I understand it, you came to believe that that was the correct choice, that, yeah. that reading too personal a poem would not have been appropriate in this setting. Yeah, it taught me a lot, of, it, it taught me a lot about just what, what is a poem and, and about audience and or things that I knew but learned in a different way. Um, and with a lot of help of friends and sort of feedback and thinking about things. Um, and yeah, I, it, it felt a bit too autobiographical, and I would have felt like it would. It would have felt like it would it sort of, as Julia Alvarez told me, that we were we'd be stealing the moment just for us, right? And really, if we think about that moment, it's really just it's for everybody in every walk of life, right? What is what is that inauguration, especially uh, you know Obama's uh, Obama's presidency, um, which is about inclu inclusivity, right? Him being the figurehead of our first African American president. 
So I thought this is not any of the right choice. But I did go back and I did learn an aesthetic and a creative lesson, right? I, in the first draft of the one today, which is the one they chose, I was still sort of a little distant. I was, I was sort of the talking head poet, like speaking at people and realized, no, and this was Sanders Cisneros who gave me this great advice. He says, go back to the, to the first draft and breathe into it. Speak, speak as if you were speaking about your mother. And that's where the, I put myself in there, little autobiographical bits. And believe it or not, that's the, the pieces that, that most people are most attracted to when, when I'm vulnerable in the poem. And I think that's the mistake that I think we, we all make when we think about an occasional poem, that we think it's just about the occasion, when in reality it's about what you feel about the occasion, right? And it's, and it's, it's as much your, it should be as much your poem as it is for the occasion. And a, it was a big lesson to learn and a, uh, and a, and a new way, it became a new way of writing, I mean, balancing the larger we with the very important I, right? And how those two things are really speaking to the same thing, but can speak at it or approach it um, from different points of views that meet in the poem. Right, you can use specificity or specific mm -hmm. details to bring universality to the poem. Like somebody can say, oh, I can relate to that detail yeah. in my own life. And you said you also didn't want it to be too political, because of course that would be right. potentially divis divisive as well. So, um, but Sandy Hook, the, the shootings mm -hmm. had just happened. And so um, similar to you um, bringing a little bit of the personal in um, about your your mom and your life into the poem, you brought, a you know, there was a, um, a side or a you know important mention of yeah. the shootings in in your poem. Yeah, and 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 that sort of very um, sort of behind the scenes private. Well, not private because I wrote about it, but um, you know I was really struggling with uh, with that second poem. I had written the first one and and I liked it, but I also knew it was a warm up in some ways, and I was like I just let it go, and I thought let me move on to the second one, and then I really got stumped. And you I started really, watching the Brady Bunch and everything. For, <laughs> that's when you're really stumped when you're, when you're watching the Brady Bunch for inspiration. Yeah, that's just, it's just crazy. They still inspire me. <laughs> but also, I just realized that even at, back then, at the age of 44, um, that there was still a little part of me that felt I needed to be Marsha Brady or Peter Brady or Greg Brady, um, and that I wasn't sure that I. I mean, that was the hardest part of the poem: was, do I really love this country? Am I really part of this country? And does this country love me back? And of course, that ends up being the title, How to Love a Country, of the, the book that came after that experience. And so it was through Sandy Hook, um, unfortunately, um, um, as all great families and their dysfunctionality, as we are as a country, right, we come together in times of great joy and times of great sorrow. And watching the, that memorial, and seeing the President of the United States cry and thinking about how, yes, we all belong together. We are, we may not get along every day like a family, but I have a right to this place and I do love this country for, uh, and I hate some of the things that, just like family, but no, I have, I have a rightful place and, and an authentic place not, that is not only given to me, but that I've given myself. And they, you know, that and that moment opened up my, what I say, the, the emotional window or the emotional door that allowed me to write that poem um, and, and, the fo and the one following. Even though I had skirted around those issues, basically my body of work is always about that. It's not every day I, I, I have, I get asked to write a poem for an entire nation, right? So that really, really drilled down into that essential question of, Am I American? What and what does that mean? And I realized even even then I was still not quite sure. <laughs> well, I love that the, at the end you you turned to your mom and said something, didn't you? Yes, um, I told her. I guess we're finally Americanos <laughs> because uh, which is basically we're finally. If it doesn't get much more American than sitting a few steps away from the president and Beyonce <laughs> and James Taylor, right? And James Taylor. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's really uh, it's mind-boggling. I'm sitting there with my mother because I chose to t take my mother. You could. You could take one person to the actual platform. I mean, you could. T I had like ten other invitees that had, you know, obviously great, great seats. But you could only take one person, and uh, and I chose my mother for reasons we talked about. It's kind of the story. This is why I 
and able to be here is because of the choices and and sacrifices that she made. But I'm sitting there and like there's the president, there's Biden, you know, and I'm like, wow, my mother grew up in a dirt floor home in Cuba. And I, I haven't lived in another country long enough, but I thought, this is perhaps one of the few or only countries where this can happen, where this sense of, of a democracy where some little working class kid from some unknown suburb of Miami is sitting steps away from the president of the United States. And I thought, this is America. What did your mom think? Did you ever get a chance to? <laughs> My mother. Get a, I know she's she's not always the most forthcoming, well, but you know, <laughs> you know as, I'm sure we have parents that are pretty much similar, right? <laughs> but you know, she's a very hard person to read, right? And I think she's very stoic and can be like, uh, and she'll always be my mother, right? Like, so no matter if we're sitting there, she, I think, of course, she's so terribly proud of me and like, and I sense all that, but she also can't let go of being a mother because, of course, she's a mother. So, um, so I was still revising the poem, well, tweaking the poem while I was waiting to be called up to the podium. And she like nudges me, it's like, be still. Like, she gives me a piece of candy to calm me down, a, 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 one of those mints or honey candies. She's complaining because it's too cold. <laughs> it's like, when are they going to start this thing? <laughs> and of course, like, you know, it's, it's just being a mom, you know, <laughs> like, even in that instance. Were you nervous? It's a, that's a massive audience. But I know you've also said that it's once you get up there on that platform, it's a pretty intimate experience. Yeah, you know, it was like, again, sitting in that moment, it is very intimate because really it's not, the platform itself is not, you know, it doesn't feel that. And you can't quite see the crowd while you're sitting down. <laughs> you can see like the a bit of it, right? But um, I think a couple things happened. Um, first of all, that was the first moment in the eight, six or eight weeks that I had to actually realize what was happening. Like, wow, so the first Latino gay immigrant person is going to read a poem at this inauguration. And it's me. <laughs> and it finally really set in how important that was, not just for me, but how important that was for the country, right? And you fi finally realize you're in service to something larger than yourself. This is a conversation the president and I would have later on in the Oval Office. Um, and that it's, you realize this is, I mean, the 4th of July hot dogs, fireworks, this is really the most, the, an inauguration of any kind is really the most defining American in, moment. I mean, that's how we were born, right? This idea that of peaceful transfer of power. And you just kind of realize this is not about Obama, it's not about James Taylor, it's not even about Beyonce, right? It is about every single one of those people here and across the country and that sense of witness of why do they show up and it's cold it's clammy it's misty and it still serves the same like to remind the president that you're there because we are here and this happens every four years and that just is an amazing you feel in service to something larger and that takes away you know the ego which is what wants to be perfect and and whatnot and then there was there's a, you know, I'm like, I really wanted to get up there, you know, by the time Kelly Clarkson was singing, I was like, come on, girl, <laughs> like, I, wanted, I just wanted to do it already, right? And so I'm like rushing to the podium and the, the president and, and the vice president stand up and shake my hand and I just didn't really expect that. And it was just like, I'm like, okay. And then I was like, wow. It wasn't like read a poem for the king. It was like their sense of honoring and, and, and saying, this is presenting me to the country as saying this is our poet, right? Not, this is not just about my presidency, this is for us, right? And then I had Obama here in Biden, and I was like, okay, they got my back, literally <laughs> and figuratively, right? And then that gave me a little boost of, and then a little, a little, another small little anecdote. So Gloria Stefan and I, um, uh, we had never met, but we had finally met in the process of all this. and. Uh, she gave me a little piece of advice and she said, take it all in. Do not run away from it because this will never happen again. And of course she's had, you know, she's been on the stage with like 50,000, God knows, like, and I, and if you look at the video, I just take this pause and I just look out because it's like, this is one of those things that's going to flash 
over through my mind before I die and not run away from it, but just embrace it. Uh, give me a, a new job, a new charge, a new self-imposed mission, which was how, you know, what is the civic role of the poet in America, right? And then using poetry um, or focusing my poetry um, uh, to bring it to spaces that it can do some work, right? Um, how do the humanities in general, poetry being one of them, have a, a create or stimulate a different dialogue for us? With poetry in particular, you know, poetry is something that's so obscured and so misunderstood in America. Also an advocate for poetry as well, an advocate for poetry education, an advocate for anywhere I can pop my poet, poetic head in and support organizations that are doing this great work in the world. And so that's become part of um, the delight and joy and reward of my work now. You've gotten letters from all over about your inaugural poem. Somebody even wants it to be read at their funeral. Yeah. That was one of the emails, yeah. Amazing. And then uh, another woman keeps it like in, near a kitchen table yeah. for when she doesn't feel all that well. She takes a look at yeah. it as kind of a unifying, optimistic poem. Yeah. That must make you feel yeah, it, so amazing. It, 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 it opened my own eyes to what a poem can do in the world. I, I still do pinch myself. I'm like, I get to be that person. Like, I get to be... And again, it gets back to my work in Classroots, right? I didn't have access to all the arts and the humanities, and we weren't talking about Picasso at the dinner table. My parents didn't even know who the Rolling Stones were, right? So we're culturally, you know, uh, isolated. There's also the sense of, you know, art is for fancy people. Um, and so I get to, so to me, it gives me a great thrill to be able to give that the open up those eyes as someone did yeah. for me. You You've know. said that you would like your poetry to reach the people who are in your poems, right, many exactly. of whom don't have that opportunity, just as you didn't, yeah. to hear poetry. On a humorous note, you know, you can now go to the Brady Bunch house. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have actually the br blueprints that were actually done up for the, the set, right? And one day I'm just going to, maybe when I win the Nobel Prize, <laughs> that'll give me enough money to, like, I just, like, here, build it. <laughs> like, You're gonna replicate I, the Brady I'm Bunch. Totally, said, like that would be my like. I don't know who I'd fill it up with. <laughs> it's funny, my, my partner and, and me, but um, that would be like. I, I would consider I have made it. <laughs> well, well, thank you for stopping down in Boise on your trajectory up. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to be here. We appreciate it. Thanks for taking my, the time. My pleasure. Thanks so much. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have. You've been listening to poet Richard Blanco. For more information, check out the Dialogue website. Just go to IdahoPTV.org and click on Dialogue. For Dialogue, I'm Marsha Franklin. Thanks for tuning in. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.